I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. I'm very pleased to be hosting Robert Kaplan, who's the president and CEO of the Inter-American Foundation. Really pleased people have come out on the snowy day. I'm particularly pleased uh, the good And uh, thanks to all of you for having, coming out on this snowy uh, Tuesday afternoon in Washington. We've had a lot of snowy days here in the last few months, haven't we? Uh, it's not sticking, fortunately, so I think Boy. we can thank, thank, thank ourselves for that. Dan, this is a great place. I've, this is my first time in the new suit at CSIS, so congratulations to you. to you all. It's, a, it's a, just a beautiful, beautiful space. Let me start out by saying a little bit about the Inter-American Foundation and, and where we've come from and what we do. Yes, I can. Is that better? Okay, good. I was watching you, and you were far a, enough I away. I have a quiet. I have only loud and really loud. So this is actually. And this I have is good. and I have a quiet and really quiet. So. Uh, <laughs> so between the two of us, we'll we should we exactly. should have the whole t range of tonality. Range. Good. Is that better? It's perfect. Perfect. Okay, I can even do that. Okay. Uh, well, the Inter American Foundation had this year is our 45th birthday, um, and uh, we started by we grew out of a congressional delegation to to Guatemala uh, in the late 60s. Uh, led by Congressman Dante Fassell from Southern Florida, who uh, was uh, with a number of other congressmen uh, visiting projects from the Alliance for Progress. And uh, during the day, they went out and visited, see the communities where projects were, were uh, uh, taking place, and they met with uh, government uh, officials and met with embassy staff. And at night, they came back and talked about what they'd seen and uh, thought about it and debated a bit. And then they said, you know, there must be a way that we can get U.S. the U.S. taxpayer dollars, U.S. Um, per, uh, relationships directly with the people in the communities themselves. There must be something that we can do there. We're not able to do that just through a bilateral government-to-government -government relationship. Let's see if we can set something else up. So they came back to Washington, and uh, pretty quickly, apparently, legislative history back then was uh, was a little bit more rapid than it is today. They were able to put something in in 1969 and uh, and approve the creation of the Inter-American Foundation as an independent agency, um, and it's independent in the sense that we don't report through any other department. We're not part of the State Department. I report to a board of directors. The board of directors is appointed by the U.S. President, uh, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, the board is made up of nine people. Uh, three of them are drawn from uh, uh, government officials, um, and six of them are, are, uh, come from, from the private sector, from private, private life. So in that sense, it's independent. The other thing that they thought was really important was to give it a broad mandate. They thought that that was also important uh, in order to give it the flexibility and the creativity to, uh, to, to carry out a wide range of, uh, of activities and, and really be able to inter interact with uh, poor, uh, poor, poor people's organizations uh, in, in the region. They thought that the independence was also important um, in order to give the IAF a long-term view so that it wouldn't just be uh, subject to you know, some of the uh, the uh, policies of the, of, the, of the moment, but that we could really take a long-term view of development uh, in the region. Um, so our mission as the Inter-American Foundation is to help communities thrive. Very simple. We think about communities, and we think that they should be places where people can 
uh, work together, they can uh, pursue their own interests, they can uh, uh, pursue their, improve whatever activities they want to improve their lives and their prospects. And uh, we think that this is an essential building block for democracy in, in the regions, that's uh, both uh, democracies that are both resilient and, uh, and vibrant. Uh, so we think that th this is a, a very important uh, American value as, as well and reflects that. So how do, we, how do we do this? We think that the best way and the way that the IF has done this for 45 years is we don't go into a country and say, this is what we're going to do. We want, we want to fund agriculture or we want to fund health. Or we don't do that. We say, tell us your best ideas and, and, and we'll consider what we can fund. Because we think that poor people, poor people's organizations and their communities, that they have assets themselves that they bring to the table. They've got ideas. They've got aspirations. So, they, so we want to hear what they have to say. We think that's a respectful way of dealing with them. We think it's a way that gives the dignity uh, to, to our interlocutors. Uh, and we think that that's fundamentally the way to empower local organizations, to empower to make their communities the best places that they can possibly be. So as I said, we receive proposals. We get about 600 proposals a year from a mix of very base, what we call base organizations. We receive them in Spanish. We receive them mostly we receive proposals in Spanish. We do receive, receive a few in English in our English-speaking countries, uh, Portuguese or Creole. We receive proposals in Creole as well. Um, so we, that all comes into the foundation. We look at them. We discuss them um, among the staff. Go out and visit any, any group, that, any uh, community where we're expecting to, to fund. So our, our uh, program officer for Nicaragua has made several uh, trips out to the Atlantic coast and, uh, in Nicaragua uh, to visit groups that we've, uh, that we've funded out there. Um, and, then, and then we make a decision to fund them or, um, or not. Uh, 600 proposals that we receive a year, we only fund about 10%. So it's a quite competitive process as, as well. Uh, and that's really, that's not the end of the story. That's really just the beginning of the story. Because then, th then we start a relationship of usually two, three, four years. Uh, it is not single year funding. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a relationship that, that lasts over time. Uh, the average grant is about $200,000 typically for three years, but uh, we've made grants as small as ten dollars or $25,000 and as much as $400,000 for something that's a little bit more uh, uh, substantial. Um, we have funded over 5,000 groups in the last 45 years. Five five thousand, and that's the, an IEF contribution of uh, six hundred and fifty of seven hundred million dollars. Over forty five years, the IEF has contributed seven hundred million dollars. The groups that we've supported themselves have either contributed, or they've mobilized from local businesses, local uh, local government, uh, local other local partners over a billion dollars. Mm. So we're not the majority partner in these in these enterprises. We're we're just. Uh, an enabler of an idea, of an initiative that comes from the grassroots themselves. We see ourselves as gap fillers. Uh, and then um, essentially we use the uh, opportunity to have a relationship over, over a few years. Currently we've got a portfolio of about 250 projects, active, active grants, uh, with a US uh, a, um, IEF uh, vet, uh, contribution of $65 million. And the counterpart is, over, is about $100 million. So, so again, it's a, it's a fair, very, very much uh, a, 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 um, a grantee run, run, run thing. Um, we also want to stress that I've st said a couple times that the, that, the, that the project, that the approval of the project is not the end, it's the beginning. We see our relationship as much beyond the project itself. Yes, we have projects with goals, we've got objectives, we've got activities, we've got indicators, all of those things. We've got, we know exactly where the money's going and I can talk about the uh, auditing that's, that, that we put in place. Every grant gets audited every, every year by a certified audit firm, local audit firm. We have results, uh, reports, and, and all of those things. But fundamentally, what we're investing in is the relationship with the organization itself because we believe that building the capability of these local organizations uh, will yield benefits that go way beyond what they achieve in this individual project. We're trying to help them to build the capability to do things beyond what, what they do with us. And uh, part of what we've done in the last few years is we've gone back and visited 
communities where projects have uh, been carried out five years after we've finished our funding, just to see what's, what's happened. And it's a very interesting uh, experience indeed to see how things have either morphed and expanded tremendously, or in some cases, you know, fallen apart, um, but, but mostly have, have, have improved. Um, the last thing I want to say is that in addition to the money that we give through a grant, this relationship, I keep on coming back to, is super important in the sense that we build relationships among the grantee partners. So I just came back from Peru last week. I, I spent a week in Peru visiting several different uh, partners, and we, one of the things that we did there is we had a two-day meeting of all two dozen grantee partners in the country where each, each one of them, most of them didn't know each other, Mm. They had no reason to know each other. They're working in many different parts of the country. We brought them together, and they told a little bit about what they're doing. Ten minutes, just enough to whet the appetite, and it's very hard. Speed dating. It's, very, it's speed dating. It's very difficult to get a group that's been, you know, this is, they're putting so much energy into this to, to keep them to just ten minutes. But that was enough to, to really spur an incredibly rich and vibrant conversation among the groups themselves. Uh, and uh, so you have a group that, that focuses on, on uh, agro, agroecology. And they're hearing from a group that's working on uh, persons with disabilities. And, and it's actually being, uh, the, the project is being presented or the initiative is being presented by a, uh, a blind woman. Um, and they're starting to th come back and they're thinking, well, there are actually people, persons with disabilities in my community. Hmm. And we're, are we really tapping into all of the re resources that we have in our community in agroecology? Are we taking it, we, now we see how, how uh, capable people are, uh, can, can we actually take advantage of that in our community? So it's really a, a form of opening people's eyes to the opportunities that they have in, in, their, in their communities that they may not even be aware of. You know, sharing experiences among women who are doing Andean weavings up in the, in the, in the Sierra. You know, again, they're learning something from, from groups that are working on, on coffee, et cetera. Doesn't sound like they'd have much in common, but believe me, they do, and they come back really enriched. So what we're looking at, what I'm really excited about over the next uh, few years, is that we're going to try to invest in, in p powering that even more, where we have not just the networks in the country, but we find some way to link those groups with groups in Nicaragua, perhaps, or groups in, uh, in, in Paraguay, uh, or groups in Chile. That, are, that we're no longer working with, that we've worked with in the past, but we maintain a relationship of, of some sort, because everybody has an opportunity to, to, to learn from somebody else. And I think there are, are, are ways that, with modern technology, but not just with modern technology, because many of these groups don't have access to the internet in their, in their, in their community itself. So we've got to find something else as well, and it's a difficult, difficult problem. I think that's a, a really powerful um, tool that, the, that poor groups can, can come to take advantage of um, just like uh, rich people have learned to take advantage of networks and, you know, and, and, and the like. So that's where I think, uh, that's one of the things I'm excited about. I'm excited about a lot of things, actually. We can get into some, of, some other things, I guess, in the, in the Q&A. I don't want to take up too much time with a, an opening statement, so Great. Dan, go ahead. I'll turn this over to you. We'll just share the microphone. We'll share it. It, it should be, I'll, I'll, it should be yeah, more of this side. One third, yeah, two-thirds. Right. That's probably... So th thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I think, could you talk about in particular that Red Ameri Ready Americas, Red Americas, and what is it? And because I think you touch on it a little bit earlier, just, just in a little bit more detail, yeah. what is yeah. that? And so Red America is a, uh, a network of corporate foundations, Latin American corporate foundations, that the IAF uh, helped to create uh, over 12 years ago, I guess, long before I, I came to the foundation. And uh, it really grew out of some work that some foundation program officers had with corporate foundation partners in a couple of countries, and there are about a dozen of them, I suppose, they came together and they started thinking in maybe one or two countries. They said, is there something that we can learn ourselves uh, and about how to do better grant making for development, uh, transforming our foundation's grant making, uh, not, just, not, to not just focus on you know, shoes in, in the local orphanage or a, a theater or painting a school or something like that, but do something that really is much closer to what the IF is talking about with grassroots development and empowering uh, uh, communities. So they came together and uh, started talking about it, developed a, uh, with our support, developed a whole approach, uh, took on board our evaluation uh, methodology, uh, ended up also creating a diploma program at the Tecnologico de, de Monterrey, uh, what, mm. Technical Institute, I guess you translate that, Technical Institute of Monterrey in Mexico. ITAM. 
No, not Itam. The tech, the tech de Monterey okay. in Monterey. And, um, and uh, now they've, it's a network that's grown to over 80 members from 11 countries in the region. Some companies we've heard of, I'm sure. Some companies you've heard of, some, some you've never, never heard of. Who are some of, of the ones that, you, that we've heard of? Well, there, there's a local Walmart in Brazil yeah. is, is one. There's Votorantim, and uh, maybe you haven't heard of in Brazil. Is, Odebrecht? Odebrecht is, is a member, that's okay. right. Uh, so there's a number of uh, corporate Arcor foundations. Arcor in Argentina? Arcor. Yeah. Arcor. Um, Whole seam in uh, several different countries. That's a Swiss company, yeah. but it's got this local, yeah. uh, local branches, and they've all set up foundations. So now, some of the things that they're working on, and we're working on with them, is well, how do you bring this practice or this experience working in communities? Because the foundations, these are community, these are corporate foundations. The staff of the corporate foundations have learned to work with community members, but not necessarily the corporation. So how do you infect the corporation itself in their relationships with community with this view of what is, it, what is uh, the behavior and the procurement uh, practices and the employment practices? And so it goes beyond just philanthropy, and it really becomes much it's, more it's, about... It's linked into their business. To their business. It's not just corporate, spo corporate social responsibility. It is business. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more... It's become a lot more complicated, the concept of social license to operate and how right. you engage in a community and what your brand is in terms of attracting either people to come work for you or stay working for you and what, what how, company, how your company is perceived is, you know is a lot more complex and the stakes are a lot higher than it was. So Red America is, a, is kind of a fervor of thinking about that. It's, and so it's, it's a network and they're, they charge membership dues. They have, they have an annual meeting. I'm going to their annual meeting next month in, uh, in Chile. Uh, they also have uh, seminars from time to time in different countries. As I said, they're in 11 countries. That's fantastic. So uh, it's, it's up and running. And they're, they're now in a process of strategic planning that we're supporting. And do you continue to, think about, to write checks to, like, to no, the Red Americas? No, we don't write checks. Well, we are we're helping them with their strategic planning exercise. So it's, not a, it's not a money relationship. It's an expertise at this point, it's At this point, it's a, it's a partnership relationship of, uh, of expertise that's and, great. and thought I mean, that's, that's what it should be. It's about, it's about it's evolving. It's like you said, it's about the relationship as opposed to Money is a part of it, but it's about networks and people and ideas. Right. What we have done and we continue to do from time to time is partner with some of the members of Red America, sure. the corporate foundations, if we want to try to reach into very small communities that, sure. where the corporation has got a presence and uh, with grants of you know fifteen or $25,000, we can partner with them. We put in a dollar for every $3 that they put in and it allows us to really get a, have a presence in some of those communities that, that can then blossom into something else. Can you talk about, um, you talked a little bit about successes and failures. Uh, we were talking a little bit in the pregame about successes and failures and how the Intermarriage Foundation thinks about successes and failures, how it does evaluations, how does it, and also how does it share learning, but how does that impact your grant making going forward? And right. how do you share that with others? Right. So we've got a very elaborate system for, for tracking results. Um, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, before the current wave of uh, enthusiasm for, for and evaluation. And there are fads in the business, right? There, I mean, are, there fads. are fads. I've we, been a beneficiary of several of them myself. I'm sure. So. I'm sure. We started something called the Grassroots Development Framework, um, which essentially, I think there's a handout somewhere uh, around for that. Um, so the grassroots development framework, we have shape it in the shape of a cone. There it is, and you can see the cone there, kind of in the bottom right-hand yeah. corner, uh, that has three levels. It's uh, results at the individual and household level, results at the organizational level, results at the community and societal level. So as we engage in, as, a, as we approve a grant to, a, to, a, to an organization, the first thing we do is we sit down with them. Our program officer visits the community, sits down, and they try to identify five or six indicators from among a suite of 40 some indicators that we've got. Only five or six, and they're supposed to be the ones that best capture what they're trying to achieve, yep. uh, but give us some, some uh, uh, standardization across, across uh, grants as well to help us. But it's, uh, it's tapped to their ability to collect the data because you don't want to overload you know, a farmer's association working on cacao with a whole bunch of you know, data collection. It's not going to be very useful. At the same time, they do need to build up the capacity to collect key data and then analyze it and, they, and, and uh, take uh, management decisions as a result. So every six months, they report to us the results of, those, uh, of those, that data collection. And we have uh, a local professional 
that is uh, contracted by us to go and visit with them, do a verification of the data, talk about the results that they're achieving and any changes that they may want to make as a result of that change. So again, building up this, it's all about the building of capabilities, the organizational capabilities to, uh, to take decisions and to, 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 to move on. So that's, that's how we work with them on the level of the individual project. We also, uh, then of course, at the end of a project, we do a project history to try to capture some of the results. That gets fed back into our own analysis process as we approve, consider new grants. Uh, we also, I mentioned uh, earlier, we do a visit uh, to some groups five years after they've ended. Uh, we've now, in the last couple of years, we've done, we've gone to, I think, uh, a dozen, and they're up on the website. We've got a summary of them up on the website, you can see. Uh, and some of them have been, again, spectacular successes. Um, I just visited uh, in Peru a group that uh, was a coffee cooperative. They came to us asking for a little bit of money to get into a new activity, which was brown sugar. Uh, that they had learned about, or they had, they got the idea from a visit to some um, uh, peers, another cooperative in in Colombia, where they sure. produce brown sugar. They said, "Wait a minute, we can do that back here in our in our communities. Maybe there's an international market for brown sugar." They talked to their coffee buyers, a French coffee buyer. This they asked the IAF for a little bit of help to to kind of get into the uh, into the into the business. We gave them a little bit of support. Ten years later. Brown sugar, uh, their their coke, their coffee, brown sugar now cacao producers as well. So they've diversified their product. Their buyer in France now is more gets more profit from the relationship with them on brown sugar than it does on coffee. So they're the barons of brown sugar of in that in of eastern Peru. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. So <laughs> that's fantastic. So that's that's one of the success stories on on the you know five years after we wouldn't even know about it if we didn't go back and, and visit. That's a on great the other hand, story. on the I, I can tell some some failures too, but maybe I maybe I'll save that. Uh, yeah, keep for that. Let's see. I like upbeat. I upbeat. Like the, yeah. The, the, the talk, you, you know, you do learn from failures as well, and I think talk, that's talk something. About that book. Yeah. So the IF back in uh, the, the IF the 70s. back in the seventies in, in the mid seventies after five years of operation, the uh, staff. This is unheard of. I don't think I could do this today. But uh, the, the IAF closed its doors for a few months and uh, decided to just sit, gather information about what it is that uh, had, they'd learned over five years of, of uh, grant making, the first five years of grant making, and wrote a book. Wrote a book. Uh, it's called They Know How. It's kind of emblematic of the, I, the IAF's uh, philosophy that it's the groups themselves that know best what they, what they need and what their priorities are. And uh, the last chapter of that book is, uh, ch is titled The Foundation as a Learner, because the foundation was set up to be a learning organization before we even knew it, before we even use called them, term. use that term. Uh, and it was learning from failure and talked about the failures of grant making. Now, nobody does that anymore. Maybe people are starting to talk a little bit about failures, but we're kind of careful to talk about failures. Uh, too much. Selective but failures. Selective failures and only things that then turn into successes. Although that is something that they did point out. It's that like sometimes those college essays, right? Like what are your weaknesses? Right, say, well, exactly. I, work, you know, I work too hard. I work, I'm, too, I'm a hard, workaholic. I'm too hard on myself. Right. Um, but they, they came up with some wonderful typologies of failures like the, uh, like the Lawrence of Arabia uh, syndrome. And after that, the, uh, you know, the, as grants were being reviewed for a number of years in the foundation, they would say, no, this looks like it's got the signs of their Lawrence of Arabia failure, which is a grant that is based on, a bet that's based on an individual charismatic member of an organization. And yeah, it's going to work as long as that person's there. But as soon as that person leaves, there's a, a risk that everything falls apart. We know that's, of course, uh, that that's the case. So we think about that very clearly when we're considering a grant. We ask about the governance structure of an organization that we're working with. What are the, what are the, what, what are the uh, relationships of the different members of the of the board, of the staff, to the to the, the founders of an organization, whatever it may be. If it's a cooperative, how do they how do they transition leadership? Um, so that sort of thing. Another found another uh, syndrome is the. Uh, Artificial insemination syndrome. Uh, they all have great that names. Is very all, interesting. What is that? Well, I think it has, don't get excited. I think okay. it has something to do with animal husbandry. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the, uh, an idea that came from an outside group that they said, this is a great idea. This is a, you know, a new product or a new process or something. These people in this area you know, would benefit from that, uh, fund this, and the IF funded it, because in some cases, because it seemed like a good idea. 
but in fact, it completely ran against the reality because it wasn't something that the communities themselves, you know, resident with them, but it confronted something that was Im embedded in their own uh, local ways of doing business or, 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 or culture or practices or, or assessment of risks. So, you know, again, we recognize that it's not, it's not rocket science. But that's something that, that we've seen uh, over and over again in the aid business is funding something that comes from the outside that doesn't really um, um, take take a take take a account of the of the local context. We, we were talking about the evolving situation in the region and being a learning organization. Could you talk about the IAF's thinking about poverty? We were having this sort of this, this very interesting conversation before about how governments in the region are thinking about how to address poverty and sort of let's call it a government, a national government to local government model that perhaps doesn't take into account, that, that perhaps doesn't necessarily bring communities into it or, 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 or talk a little bit about that because I thought that was a very interesting so, insight. So I was making the observation before we, before we came into the room that, um, um, that uh, there, there's been a lot of success in Latin America in, in uh, reducing poverty. I mean, it's, in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years. Yeah. You, can, you can see it. The late rates have come down. Brazil, you know, it's a success story in some respects. And a, a lot of the way that has happened is through vertical programs that come from the, the government to some of these are conditional cash transfers. To the provinces or to the No, state. to the individuals. Oh. To individuals. So to individuals in exchange for participating in a, uh, a health assessment program or in a, at going, keeping their kids in school. And these are very effective at uh, eliminating, at really putting in place the right incentive to invest in human capital of the, at, the fa at the family level. My observation was that is great as far as it goes, uh, but it, I think it needs to be complemented by investments that really build community. I, there, there's, I don't see the same sort of attention being paid to building the capacity of people to work with each other to achieve a common end. Uh, and, I, and I worry that some of the, that many of the programs are really uh, too focused uh, by being only focused on the individual and not being focused on building the kinds of uh, civil society and social capital that we see is so, so important that, that's, uh, that, that in fact it's, uh, it's, it's more fragile than it, than, than it would otherwise be. So I see that as something that the IAF does very well by focusing on the collective, um, the ability to work together. As I said, I think uh, early on, they, we think that the, the ability for people from a community to get together and, and address a problem or uh, uh, take advantage of an opportunity is really a building block of democracy that unless you nurture that, it's not gonna just uh, take place uh, simultaneously. I think, if I recall correctly, Dante Fischel had, was rem is fondly remembered for many things, but one of the things that he's remembered for is being a proponent of democracy promotion, if I recall correctly, in terms of, I think he's one of the founders of National Democratic Institute, among okay. others. Can you talk a little bit about your, just to go a little bit further about this relationship with democ democracy or democratic accountability, how you... So, a further about this. Right, so we, we do, some, some of the groups that we fund uh, do participate in participatory budget, uh, that's a it's a it's a wave that has really taken off in many countries of the, of the region where you have budgets that are being decided at the municipal yeah. level um, and Peru I was just in Peru another example from 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 Peru where there are lots of resources that come in part from royalties from yeah. mining yeah. that are that make the uh, municipal governments or regional governments awash in, in resources and there are rules for applying them and it needs to be a participatory process for setting the priorities so we're supporting a number of groups in Peru that are participant at the municipal level that are that are working with these roundtables to try to set priorities. And one of the farmers, I mentioned this coffee cooperative, that is now a sugar brown sugar and cacao cooperative. One of the farmers it, that that I met as I was out in this tiny little town um, is on his local participatory budgeting council. This is a, this is I don't know if he's illiterate, but he's a very very humble. Farmer has had never really spent any time out of that area, but he had an opportunity to participate in setting of budgetary priorities for for his uh, for his area. That's not something that we fund directly in that particular sure. case, but in other cases we do. We are funding groups to participate, to participate in that. That's right. Um, can you talk about why? What does the United States get out of the Inter-American Foundation doing its work? as opposed to, say, the Tinker Foundation or as opposed to, say, the Ford Foundation 
And talk a little bit about that survey you were telling me about yeah, and right. part of your answer. So I, the, the Intermark Foundation is a very, uh, very small investment of U.S. taxpayer dollars. I think, uh, I think our staff figured out that it's equivalent to about six cents uh, per, per taxpayer. Uh, per year is our current budget. Um, I'm maybe looking around here for my right. Yeah, for your, do you want to double your <laughs> right, investment? Right, double down, right. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things that that really is nothing. I mean, six cents per. That's great. Yeah. So one of the things that um, that we were trying to get a handle on is as we talk with our our um, the, you know, our oversight committee on on Capitol Hill is well, what are we getting for this? What you know is there a a um, an advantage to the perception of America in, in, in the region, for example, apart from all of the be the development benefits, um, what is in it for what is in it for me, as you ask? Um, so we participated uh, two years ago in something called the Grantee Perception Survey. It's run by a group uh, called the Center for Effective Philanthropy. That's a very good group. It's in Boston. It's in Boston. Yeah. That's right. We're the only government agency. At that time, we were the only government ag agency ever to have participated in that survey. I think probably we still are the only one. Um, and it's a great survey because if I send a survey out to my grantee partners, I'm going to get feedback. And it's all going to be great. They're going to say I'm great. Oh, you know, you're, you know, you, everything you do is right. You know, you're Give so smart. You know, blah blah. Right. Yeah. So the Center for Effective Philanthropy thought one way to get around that is to have a standard survey that we send out to, you know, a bunch of foundations. So not just the Inter American Foundation, but to the Ford Foundation's grantee partners, or the MacArthur Foundations, or the Gates Foundations, or you know. So there are, I think, 300 different foundations that have now participated. Some work only in the United States. Some work internationally. Yeah. And then what, we, what you do is you see how, or they do, because it's confidential, they, uh, they compare our grantee partners' responses to the grantee partners, to the grantee responses from other foundations, and then see where are we above, where are we below, where may we want to, to think about making some, some changes as a result. It's not a strictly scientific comparison, because of course the grantees are different for us than they are for these other foundations. Uh, they're they're, they're, they're quite different in nature, but also different in, in, in specifics. But uh, we had a 74% participation rate, which is really high. Mm. Uh, That's amazing, high. really amazing. How, how much is a 74%? So, so it was 50? Uh, no, no, it was, we, I think it was of 250 grantee partners. I think so 74% was, oh, so that's you do the math, it's 150. 150. So it was a <laughs> very high participation very high rate. Number. And uh, there was, there was um, in that survey, we asked the question, has your relationship with the Inter-American Foundation, because it's mostly a standards questionnaire, but you get a chance to ask, you know, five or, five or so questions, right? So one of the questions we asked um, was, how has working with the, or has the working with the Inter-American Foundation changed your perception of the United States? And 75%, if I remember correctly, said it has improved or strongly improved the relationship with the United States. I think another 25% said, should say the same, maybe 1% said it, you know, Near Negative. down or whatever. I don't know because you guys are too bureaucratic or something. And, yeah, right. I don't really. I don't. I don't know. Mean but mean program officer. But the great, the, That's the, great. The, so the participation survey was really terrific. But then the other thing that was really terrific is getting the comments. Because in addition to the standard comments on a you know yeah. SAT type sure, of, of course. The, there was opportunities for writing in specific comments about the relationship with the foundation. And one of the things that I'm really very proud of, because I talked before about our emphasis on building the capabilities of the organizations, the thing that we did best on, and in fact better than any, any grantor that the Center for Effective Philanthropy had ever surveyed before, uh, was on the question of how our procedures and systems contribute to grantees' own capabilities. They said that our, just the way of working with us, uh, the, our grantees said, strengthened them uh, more than any other organization said that the systems that the Gates Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation uh, strengthened or them. Or AID. Well, no, AID wasn't a, wasn't a participant in this, uh, in this case. So let me just follow that just a little bit further because I think there's a whole conversation in the broader international development discussion about country ownership. I don't know how much yeah. you follow this stuff about of course. The Busan yep. Declaration and the Global Partnership. So it just seems to me that when I look at much of sort of the traditional official aid architecture or bureaucracy, I don't hear that kind of response from most 
official aid agencies, though they would like to have that kind of response. Are you take what I'm trying to get at is have you done have you taken that have you told the story to the DAC or the OECD or you talk, I mean have other don bigger donors come to you and said how do you do this and how, how are you sharing this with other official donors or how are you sharing this with philanthropy mm -hmm. in addition to sort of the learning that the Center for Effective Philanthropy because I, I actually think that's quite interesting and and actually something you all could be you know have something to share with donors in addition to what you're yeah. sharing with how you're dealing with how you engage and partner right. with and have sophisticated and meaningful relationships with, with partners on the ground. Right. Well, no, we haven't, we haven't had the discussion with a uh, member of the DAC or OECD. Um, and I think there Paris are focuses. Paris is lovely in April. Well, maybe that's where I should you go. Should be I, I, I should be going there today. Manny since can go, you and Manny can, can make, a, yes. make a special trip. Yes. Uh, no, so we haven't done that. But we have talked with other uh, we, we do have some relationships with other uh, foundations who have come to us and they said, well, actually, you have a platform that is useful for serving a kind of group yeah, that of we can't really reach. You're cost effective. Uh, we, for us to, to, to build a program to provide the kind of service that you provide would be too costly, so we'd like to partner with you. And I think that this story about That's how our story. grantee partners see us is, uh, really reinforces how that. How many staff do you have? We've got just about 40 staff. Here in Washington, massive bureaucracy. Massive, 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 massive bureaucracy. We can fit all. We can fit on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and talk about your relationship. We were having a little bit of a conversation earlier about how you engage with the interagency, if I can call it that. So the State Department. Do you have any kind of a formal relationship with AID? So let's talk about that, and then I want you to talk about your this interesting legacy relationship with the Inter American Development Bank. Oh, Separately. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back okay. to that, but talk okay. first about so, how you work with state, state why, why do they want to work with you and so, others. So we, we, have a, we have a board of directors, and uh, in, in the past it has been the case that the Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere has yep. been on our board. Roberta Jacobson, the current Assistant Secretary of State, has uh, currently before the Senate as a nominee to our board, but has not yet been confirmed. Um, and I'm not presuming anything. No, so. Of course not. Um, and uh, we, we have in the past also had the assistant administrator for USAID on our board. Uh, oh, but for, Latin for Latin America. That is not currently the case. So there's, there's that you sort of. Is that open right now? Or? That it, uh, we have, well, no, we have three government. Three USG people. We have um, Kelly Ryan, who is uh, uh, from the Department of Homeland Security, but is currently at the Migration. Uh, okay. Uh, institute, and she's a refugee specialist. Okay. Uh, um, and then we have two open ones. One is uh, Roberta, da Roberta Jacobson. They're not designated as state, per se. Okay. It can be anybody. The president has free discretion okay. to name anybody. In fact, uh, Bill Riley from the EPA was on our board. Really? Uh, Hattie Babbitt. In, in Bush 41. In Bush 41. In Bush 41, yeah. He was the right. head of EPA. He was the head of EPA 41. Uh, so we had the, the president really can choose who he wants, and that's why in this case Homeland Security was uh, it's, it's more of the I think a confluence of interests and and specific issues. Uh, and Mark Lopez is also a, a current He's a great nominee. guy, and hope he gets confirmed. Don't want to want to presume anything, but he'd represent us very well at the as USCD at the at the, at the, at the Development Bank. So that, that those are our three, uh, uh, both current member and uh, and and nominees. So, so, just so, 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 so that's, that's one way that uh, we have a relationship with the State Department traditionally. But also the State Department the, the, um, came to us and said, look, we don't have the ability to work with uh, um, groups that, um, of, um, on, social, on social inclusion. Um, so they had a, pr a program that they, were, they had committed to, the U.S. government had committed to as part of the Summit of the Americas, one of the last Summit of the Americas. I can't remember what the program is called. It's got some acronym that I do remember, but I uh, but I don't remember what how you spent, sp spell business. it out. Right. There are, and uh, so they asked us to carry it out for them. So we are directing our grant making with groups that we're at about I think twenty percent of the grants that we make are for uh, traditionally uh, marginalized groups like uh, African descendant or indigenous peoples or persons with disabilities. Or, so they asked us to uh, to reach out to some of them with some special and uh, some new funding sure. to, to, to 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 work with them and try to to network them as well. So that's one way that they've sought that it was in our in their interest to work through us for an initiative that they that that, that they had. To work with TDA or AID. Not with TDA with the, and with the USAID we do uh, work uh, in the countries that we had that we are both working. We talk with them from time sure. to time. 
uh, in the missions. Uh, I was just in Peru. Do you have to get Peru. permission for your program officers from the ambassador to come into the country? Uh, we do have not. Yes, we have to cut in order to travel. We do, and also every grant that we make, we first um, before we approve the grant, we share it with the ambassador and ask for a, a view or just make sure that there's okay. no issues about the the group itself. It's not a programmatic decision, but it's just More a, a courtesy. It's a courtesy, but it's also useful for us if there's any any they concerns have, have, about they have, that. They that have tacit knowledge on the ground that, you that we can't that we wouldn't necessarily that. have. So yeah. it's a protection for for us as well. With USAID, when I first uh, came to the IAF about three years ago, I sat down with uh, with Raj Raj Shah. I went down and vi visited other heads of agency as well. Uh, Daniel Johannes at the MCC yeah. at that time, um, um, and others. Um, and uh, Raj had the idea that we should come up with a joint statement about how we complement each other. So we had our staff sit down and work that out. And at that point, Raj was talking about um, procurement reform and working with local groups, was intrigued by the you fact that we have an experience doing of doing that. that. That's sort of what was leading in my question right. earlier. So, so we've, we've shared our experience doing that. In fact, what we think the complementarity is is that some of the groups that we work with are very much more basic than some of the groups yeah. that they could possibly have a, a contractual relationship, because they're talking about it as a contractual of relationship course. rather than a grant-making uh, relationship. But they can eventually maybe take on the, uh, the role. And so in this grantee exchange that I mentioned in, in Peru, a local USAID officer came and gave the spiel about this is what USAID does. This is, uh, you know, there may be opportunities for, for, for you if you're within these narrow, you know, defined, narrowly defined areas that, that USAID works. So we do work with the US gov other government agencies. We also are a participant in the President's Partnership for Growth Initiative. In, uh, it's in four countries. One of them is in El Salvador uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and is Peru also one, I think? No, there's, no other, there's only one in Latin okay. America. I can't remember where the others are. It's Ghana, Philippines, and somewhere else. It's definitely Philippines, probably Ghana, um, but I don't, I don't I recall. I remember the fourth one. In I was focused on there's Latin America. There's a prize for the, whoever remembers the fourth one, but... But we'll come back to that. We can come back on the Q and A. But but so so El Salvador. So we were participating in with all of the agencies that are do that have uh, programs in El Salvador, and our program we present as contributing to I think okay. the, the one of the two pillars, uh, mostly the pillar on on uh, economic development on uh, uh, community businesses. Uh, but we have we're, we're carrying out a chronic violence learning project, so we're also sharing some of the lessons that we're trying to learn together with our grantee partners about violence in their communities. Talk about this really interesting legacy relationship with the Interamerican Development Bank. Right. I was fascinated. So it's, uh, it's less a relationship with the Interamerican Development Bank than we're the beneficiary of a, f a trust fund that the U.S. government set up at the Interamerican Development Bank over 50 years ago to, to uh, make loans, uh, low-interest loans, to Latin American governments. Uh, alongside the Fund for Special Operations of the Inter-American Development Bank. And as those funds reflowed back, both principal and interest, reflowed very little interest, but uh, principal mostly, they have, been, have come to the IAF for the last 40 years uh, to fund a portion of our program. So our, currently it's about $5 million a year. There's very little money left. It's you know the trust fund that was set up 50 years ago. Uh, the, I think they're mostly 50-year... 50-year loans, so that's just about to run out in the next few years. Uh, but that's that that's the, the legacy. So every year we get a little bit of resources, and that can only be used to fund projects in countries of Latin America. That can't be used to fund any of our uh, staff costs or, or you know our our office. But it's significant. But it's yeah, it's about five million dollars a year these days. It's real money. It's real yep. money. So, last question. Uh, we've been talking about the evolution of the region. You talked a little bit about that earlier. And I, I, we were having this discussion earlier at beforehand. Of how, how do we, how does the Inter-American Foundation evolve with the countries as they get wealthier? And how does, what does it mean for the Inter-American Foundation to be involved in a country like a Chile or a Costa Rica or maybe a Brazil where it may not be about money and it was never really, and, and to some extent we were having this conversation, it wasn't necessarily about money all along, it was sort of about that was sort of a vector of ideas or a catalyst for getting something going that others kind of step into. But how I know you're thinking about this, yeah. and it doesn't have to be a resolved answer. But we've done some work on middle-income countries and thinking about it at a state-to-state -state level. 
And I thought your point earlier about this isn't necessarily, we're not, you're not in the business of state to state. You're in sort of a, the social capital business or the, the individual building, uh, individual accountability or sort of a, a grassroots form of democracy, which I, I agree, I don't disagree with. So talk a little bit about how, how you think about that as these countries become sort of follow the path of a South Korea, and they're not necessarily a South Korea yet. I was just in Seoul two weeks yeah. ago, and it was jaw-dropping, so I know we're, mm -hmm. we're not there yet, not but there. I, we can always hope. But I think we're going in that direction in a lot of places. God willing, Chile and Costa Rica are really impressive. I mean, they've made incredible strides. The region's made incredible strides. So I know that must be on your mind, and how are you thinking about that, and how... How, what, is it, what are you hearing from your, your grantees about this? Yeah. Well, I think a number, number of things. I think uh, that's where the, a network like the Red America Network comes in, and particularly in a country like Chile, we have a very small program. At this point, we're just working with a couple of Red America foundations to help them to make the to, to, to really get their heads around doing grassroots grant making like, uh, like we do. But we're not going to continue doing that for very much longer. So in Chile, for example, we're thinking we're looking now, well, what, what do we want to do next? Uh, and what are we? Th what what would be appropriate um, for the next five years? And that's where I come back to with my comments earlier about the network. Well, um, we have 250. We we worked with 250 groups in Chile over the last 45 years. Now some of the groups are no longer in existence. Some of them wouldn't be interested in participating with us. But that is a huge resource that is waiting to be tapped, and uh, and 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 for the benefits of themselves for Chilean civil society more broadly and for others, for others to be able to learn from what they, what they have done in, in Chile uh, on a whole range of issues. So by themselves, it's, it's not, not enough. Um, but if we can plug them into a, a region-wide network and start getting exchanges, you, you can have an exchange from the country that you have no, a special no. fine, fondness for Argentina with, uh, with some Chile Chilean civil society organizations that are working on issues that, have, that might be appropriate. So that's one way that I think about how we might work in a country where we're not going to do the kind of responsive grant making that I talked about before. We're not, at this, these days, we don't, uh, we don't get many proposals from Chile, but in fact, in Chile, we wouldn't, we wouldn't just respond to a proposal from a, from a grassroots group per se. We're gonna be much more directive about how we, how we work there. Other countries will continue to be follow the same responsive model. The Central American countries, a lot of places in, you know, in the Andes, et cetera, uh, and even in Brazil, I think there are lots of places in Brazil that really uh, warrant having a continued involvement of the the nature, the northeastern part of the country, some of the the, the central west, or some tremendous problems, and also some exciting opportunities that you don't you you you, you wouldn't be aware of unless you're. You're, you're plugged in there. So, for example, this past fall, I was in uh, the north of Mato Grosso State, uh, about two hours north of a, about two hours north of Sinop, which itself is about a two, uh, an hour flight north of Cuiabá. So, the, which is itself is probably you know I don't know oh I don't know where your, your, your point of reference is. I don't know where your your points of reference, but it's way Good up there. Lord. Well, the fascinating thing is, this is a group, a grassroots cooperative, that has I can't remember how many members but they're producing vegetables for the Sinop organic vegetable demand. So you're, we're starting to find in countries like Brazil, in countries like Argentina, in countries like Chile, obviously, I was in, in Peru, there's demand for organic produce. Now, I, I, you know, maybe that's not news to some of you, but for me, I was thinking about organics as much more, you know, for the U.S. and and uh, European market, but there's a sophistication now in even very small places in, in Latin America uh, and a demand for, for quality, uh, for organics, and, and a consciousness uh, about um, pesticides and, uh, and, and chemicals. Uh, so I think those are the kinds, the kinds of trends that you wouldn't actually have an opportunity to spot unless you're, unless you're, you know, unless you're present there. And I think it's valuable to, to a whole host of partners uh, that, that, that there is that. Well, look, you've been patient as an audience. Why don't we open it up? Uh, Ambassador, if you would like to ask a question, I'd be so pleased. I'm really pleased you're here. Welcome again for coming. I'm really happy you're here. Uh, but I know there's some thoughtful people here. I'd, I'd welcome, uh, I know uh, Mr. Cavill would also welcome them as well. Otherwise, I've got at least a half dozen more questions, but I don't want to subject all of you to all of my questions. So, Yes, sir. Just hit the microphone. <coughs> 
Where do you find staff that has... Just self uh, my name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a consultant in agricultural development. Where do you find staff that has the uh, special character that it would seem that it takes to uh, handle such nuanced and uh, precise kinds of projects? That's a, yeah, it's an interesting question. They come from all backgrounds. Uh, I, th I assume you're talking principally about our program officers. Um, um, they come from a number of different backgrounds. We, many are former Peace Corps volunteers who then work, maybe worked in a, in a nonprofit. Um, we have a couple of ex-world bankers um, who saw the light, I guess. Uh, I, well, I don't, I'm, it's a joke. My, all my friends at the World Bank. Um, so I, I don't, I think that there's a, there are a lot of people who have that sort of special vision of respect and, and, uh, and working with poor people to, to empower their organizations. I think when they come into the organization, they, they're, there's, they get steeped in the, in the, in the culture as, as well. Um, there, we have, uh, it, it's wonderful. Every year we have a whole crop of interns, young interns that are working, doing work at George Washington or American University or Georgetown or you know, mostly local universities, but even universities far, farther afield. Um, they, they'd love to, to work with us and we'd love to have them working with us because you know, we are a small agency and you can always get the extra bestie. So I think that that's another uh, group that you know, several years down the road when they gain some experience doing something else, I expect to see them uh, rotate back in. Our vice president for programs currently, uh, he, he describes himself as a recidivist. He was a program officer at the foundation back in the mid 80s, then left and went to work at the Ford Foundation, a number of uh, other, uh, both grant makers and grant takers. Grant takers. Uh, and then it came back, I, I hired him back uh, uh, a few years ago as a vice president for programs. So they, from all, all, all over the place. Sir. Uh, my name is Donaldo Hart. I'm actually Brazilian from Goiás, not too far from Goiás. Ah, not so far. Good. But, um, do so you, you've, been to, you've been to Sinop? Yeah, un poco longe. Un poco longe, sí. Do you provide technical, in addition to program officer orientation to your grantees, do you provide any form of technical assistance? That's an excellent question. So the grants that we make include the, and they're transferred to the organization themselves, and often it's for them to acquire the technical assistance uh, that they need, the technical expertise that could be available locally. Sometimes they, when I mentioned that they put in or mobilize resources from others, sometimes that's um, um, in-kind support from a local um, extension agent uh, or, or something like that. So there, a lot of that is built into the, the grant itself. In addition, we have um, a re contractors in about 15 country, about 15 contractors spread, spread around that facilitate uh, the identification of other kinds of technologies. They don't provide it themselves necessarily, but they're in some senses our eyes and ears, and they can help to connect what's most valuable if they need technical assistance from somebody else that is doing that, another grantee partner, we can facilitate the, the trip. Because you know, one, one of the things that we find is that more valuable than somebody than giving somebody a, uh, you know, a lecture on something uh, is give, taking them to see how it's being done elsewhere. And that spurs a whole host of questions that, that it's just a much more effective learning process. So that's what we try to do in the country or, as I, as I mentioned, in, in other places. We've, uh, we, um, facilitated a number of people from all over the region going to um, Brazil, southern Brazil, about a year ago for the Ecovida uh, conference that you may, that you may know about. Um, and, that was a, and that's led to sustained uh, long-term relationships among Mexican, Peruvian, uh, Honduran, um, and, and Brazilian, Brazilian groups. Okay. Sir, it's uh, Michael Gill from the Global Giving Foundation. Hey. Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't think that we, we don't have, I don't know that we have a, 
structured process that you know I could lay down in, in, a, in a manual. But what typically I think happens is that as we get you know, close to the end of the, the project, things uh, do wind up. As I said, we don't think about the project so much itself as we think about the relationship. So there may be some legacy things that go on after the, the money itself is being transferred in terms of you know, we they will continue to invite them to grantee uh, exchanges, uh, even though they're not a current uh, grantee, or there might be something else that they may ask us to to, to help them to support to visit some you know someplace else. Uh, so there's there's some of that. Um, Sometimes we press them into service as as trainers or as a technical assistance, as a, as previous uh, questioner asked. Um, we also are very attentive during the course of the project to what is the likelihood of sustainability, and we're asking the question: How are you going to sustain this after, you know, that our minority partnership ends? But how, how are you going to sustain it? Um, and that's always a challenge. Um, but uh, they, they're, they're looking at a lot of, depending on the, on the topic, of course, there are lots of creative ways to, to continue on. Occasionally, we, occasionally they do come back and, get, and ask for another grant to do something else a couple of years later. We don't usually do it. We can, we can extend uh, a, a, a grant um, if we think it's warranted. Um, once it stops, we don't go do back to back funding, but we'll let it lapse for let the relationship last for a couple of years in terms of funding, and then sometimes we've come back and, and funded something else. So this coffee cooperative that I mentioned, where we finance brown sugar, they they are currently uh, a uh, working with us on cacao, uh, where it turns out that they've got this kind of this variety of cacao that is was thought to exist only in Venezuela and is but is also um, there in uh, in northern Peru. Great. Other, others? Well, Mr. Kavan, I'm just wondering if you might want to just share some either just parting thoughts about the Inter-American Foundation and what it, why it, why it matters for, why, it, why it's valuable for the United States to continue to support it. Because I, I, I think you've, you've, I think very well described that and very articulately so, but just, just for the, if you would, just for the record. For the record. Just for the record. This is about a congressional testimony yes, here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, uh, I mean, as I've said uh, earlier, I think that investment in the Inter-American Foundation and the work that we do is really pennies on the dollar. Um, it's a great investment. It's cost effective. It is direct to, it's building direct relationships with people on the ground that gives um, us an insight into what is happening on the ground and also an ability to connect groups that otherwise couldn't uh, couldn't connect with, uh, with themselves. It's a... Uh, uh, it's complementary to a lot of the other work that is being supported with USAID or with the State Department or, or other U.S. Uh, agencies. And I think that we have something that we can offer to businesses through the, through the Red America type of relationship, not just with corporate foundations, but with which is really thinking about corporate business practices as, as, as well as they, as people are really are struggling with how can corporations um, engage with communities in a way that really helped them to thrive and uh, and, and, and bloom. Uh, so I think there's a whole host of different ways. I think fundamentally the work that we do, building uh, vibrant societies, social capital, uh, is in the interest of the United States. Um, so I think it's a, a good investment uh, for the U.S. taxpayer and through the U.S. Congress to, to continue to support. I love that survey about the, uh, the participants. It's really... I use it a lot. It sticks with me. <laughs> Thanks very much. Please join me in thanking Mr. Kaplan. Thank you.